This is my presentation about a research project that we've been undertaking for quite a long time. It's a multi-year project with many thousands of students involved. So we're going to look at the best practices for live synchronous online learning. And the approach is an action research based approach. So what we're doing is we're really looking at students' actual behaviors, but also teachers. So this project is really going to give you some input from the teacher's perspective. And this all took place before the COVID-19. So it has a lot of application at COVID times because it's really talking about what are the best practices for a synchronous online learning situation. Very quickly, this presentation and the research in general is going to cover synchronous learning and what it's made up of. The action study we did with more than 3,000 students. The technology, how it works basically, but mainly what its main problems are. Difficulties from the human behavior perspective and especially issues related to guidelines that can help us to do a better job so that we're not just stuck with some of these problems that we've had. Finally, we're going to present a model called the Nexus of Control, where we actually look at what are the best ways to control this situation to get these issues under control, and specifically what are the two dimensions that we focus on from these many thousands of examples over many years of experience. First of all, let's not panic and let's get some terminology clear because it's a little bit scary sometimes. What we're going to be talking about or looking at is the multi-online learner RPG. So in this study, we were almost always dealing with RPG, sometimes straight lecture classes, but usually some amount, if not a lot of amount, of student self-learning or self-directed learning. Synchronous learning, so here I abbreviate it as slide. Video conferencing or VC. And immersive virtual environments, IVE. So the main parts here that we're going to be talking about are these two at the bottom here, VC and IVE. So video conferencing, which nowadays everyone just calls Zoom or whatever you want to, whatever program you're using an IVE, which is a more virtual, uh, uh, more engaging, more like a kind of uh, RPG game where, where students, learners, and teachers are virtual avatars, that kind of thing. So a little bit different, but still the key point that keeps them the same is their synchronous. Now, why do we want to look at this now? Why is this important? Well, of course, during the COVID time, it's very important, and we have a lot of synchronous classes. But the main reason we began this research many years ago are that young people are very uh, acculturated to playing MMORPGs. They play a lot of games online, for example, Minecraft or Sims, one of the biggest selling games of all time, Sims. And of course, you've heard of Second Life, which is the 3D virtual immersive environment. Now, Second Life is not so much for young people these days, but Sim certainly is, and Minecraft has become huge. Many elementary school students begin playing Minecraft uh, on their computers and handheld devices. So these hit video games are 3D, they're immersive, and they allow players to basically do anything they want. They can explore that world inside the virtual reality. Now, in a course, in a situation like Minecraft, you have big blocks, it looks blocky, but that's on purpose, and young people like that. It's still immersive. In Second Life, you create more like a realistic perspective, but even there, you can create crazy stuff that's not possible in the real world, and people like that. So, of course, the easy example are other games like first-person shooter games. These young people are all used to this by the time they come to college and certainly even by the time they're in high school. So we need to really be ready for that, in my opinion, and that's what we focused on 
over this multi-year project. Now action research you may be familiar with is a kind of continuous process of qualitative analysis. It's not just free form do anything, but what you do is you have a kind of cycle that you worked on where you take some action and then you get some feedback. In this presentation, I have two projects we're going to be looking at, a VC and an IVE, VC video conferencing, and the IVE is the immersive environment, the immersive virtual environment. So the VC is video, which I think you're probably all very familiar with now in COVID days, and the IVE, which you know about, but maybe you haven't used in your classroom. So up on the top right of the slide there, you're going to keep seeing this is the index of the presentation. At the end, I'm going to present a model which I call the nexus of control. The research stages are represented by these parts here. Action planning, where you plan an action. Then action taking, what is the action that was taken in the classroom, in the classroom design, in the pedagogy design. Evaluating what your action impact was specifying the learning that took place and then diagnosing what kind of problems there are and then you cycle back again. So you have this constant cycle of going around and around over multiple semesters, multiple years of executing the same or similar classes or the same techniques. We worked with my own classes, other teachers classes and my co-authors classes in some research we published uh, separately from this, but this is more of an overall kind of general view I'm going to give you today rather than a detailed kind of um, analyze analysis perspective. Let's begin with the thing that we're all familiar with, and this we undertook a beginning about 10 years ago, which would be the video conferencing software. So of course the video conferencing software, uh, you get everybody in a virtual classroom and they all have a live video feed and audio. So we're going to begin looking at this idea as stage one. So if you see up here, this is where we are now, stage one. And we're gonna have three stages of cycling over, trying different things. So in the virtual, uh, in the video conferencing situation, we have an action planning. And our action planning at the beginning was to execute video systems, to get audio and video synchronized and live. So students meet online for some classes, and today we often just call them Zoom classes, right? But this is rather recently. But the video conferencing has been around for about 15 plus years. It tends to be lecture driven, and that is a teacher is giving a lecture, and the students are watching the teacher, and they may be able to see other students also. So I think this is very common now. Then we collect the data, we collect some survey data, we make observations and field notes, and we kind of categorize all of that, and we come up with some evaluation. And you may have experienced similar issues that we experienced. So for example, audio equipment was always a problem when we did this video conferencing at the very beginning audio feedback and audio echoing problems. Of course, the correct solution for this is to use headphones or earbuds, but that is something we're gonna learn is easier said than done. So for specifying the learning, we find out that teachers and students reported their online experience is promising, and you do get some good learning uptake. It is possible. It's not like the video conferencing presents a problem. And I think today, during the COVID time, we can see that that's true. Many people are using Zoom as a classroom or other programs, and they're being very successful at it. But the biggest problem that we diagnosed was the audio problem. It really prevented the classes from going smoothly. It always brought up the problem that if there was a problem it was going to be the audio problem so students problems are not solved easily when you're in a video meeting maybe you've experienced this also and that is you're in the video meeting you have all of those faces on the video screen then one student has a problem or one student's microphone goes dead or one student is using an open microphone so it's causing an echo how do you stop that not an easy thing to do because you cannot do anything through this virtual video environment and it's live. 
So that time pressure, the pressure of the class has a limited time, so you have to solve your problems or just move on. We find that what ends up happening is lots of teachers just move on. Problems don't get solved. So the next step in the next approach or the next stage in this, what we call stage two, you see, so now we're at stage two. So we cycle back and this is another academic semester and we're using the same approach, but now we're modifying it. So we're adding more features. So in this part of the study, we're looking at what happens when you take that basic video meeting idea and then you add more features. Let's look at some of the features we added. Here's a picture of what you can see. Things you're probably familiar with, uploading ability, text and documents can be seen on the desktop, uh, students can upload using a whiteboard, etc. things like this. So in our action planning, we went ahead and planned to try to reduce the audio feedback problem. Then in the action, we give students an on-screen mute button. So in this situation, students can press a button and they can mute themselves. Or we also designed a feature where they could press a button and mute others. So if they were hearing an echo, they could mute somebody. So we're adding that as part of our action. Then we evaluate that and we found out that yes, when students and teachers had buttons to mute, mute themselves and mute others, it did help to block some of that echoing and feedback static and problem but it didn't prevent it totally. And this is an interesting idea that the students who have the really serious problems are the students that are not easy to solve their problems. And they are the ones that keep having a problem. And so how do you overcome that? Not an easy thing to do when all you have is this video link between you. So when we looked at the learning, the audio feedback is a personal responsibility and it's really hard to have students who have a problem with that to solve it since it's their personal issue. Their headset, their computer, their microphone. It's difficult to overcome it at the class level. Of course, this would not be the case if you had a live classroom. When you have a live classroom and say a student starts talking out loud or students in a group are talking too loud, you can ask them, please be quiet. We're having class, please pay, a pe pay attention. But when you're in the vid vid video meeting live, it's difficult for you to tell, hey, uh, uh, Harry, your microphone is causing an echo. Because his microphone is open, the sound is going out, his speaker's in his microphone, but he doesn't hear the echo. Others hear the echo, but they're not sure what's causing it. It's a very confusing situation. I'm sure you've experienced it. Now. Uh, we diagnose this problem and we try to find a more centralized way to solve this. Is there a way for the teacher from a central position to solve it? So now we move on to stage three. So again, what we're doing here is we're using this process where we execute the class, we add some features, then we add a few more features, then we add a few more features, and we do a qualitative analysis each time around to see what its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. So here we're finishing up with the last stage of adding more features to the video conference. And here we've moved on to a couple more uh, professional level um, environments. These are not Zoom, but very similar in many ways. So let's take a look at this. In our action planning, we are looking at adding whiteboards, uploads. Uh, you can actually play videos and students could play videos that they found say on YouTube maybe, something like that, live videos that they could play. And we also looked at what was available for executing this. And we had some software like Open Meeting, Big Blue Button, of course, Zoom, and Adobe's products. All these products are possible. In our project, we focused on Open Meeting and Big Blue Button, which are open source. So we, had, we could install those ourselves on our own servers and manage everything, including data collection. And when we evaluate this, the result of this, what we end up seeing is something interesting where lots of features are really cool. For example, can students play a video? Like maybe you have some group work and students were supposed to maybe find some videos on a topic on YouTube. So they play those videos and then the class can see them. That's really interesting, that's cool. Whiteboard, shared whiteboard, subgroup whiteboard, private rooms, all these features in this stage three we were adding in because it adds on top of stage two, which adds on top of stage one. So by this point, we're getting a lot of really cool features and they sound awesome. 
and the teachers we are working with love to hear that when you have a meeting before the semester begins. One problem though was the audio and the audio problem just really never goes away and in this case the solution we find that always works is students having headphones. So they have the headphones with the microphone but if you only have one, all you need is one. Out of 50 students, one student not using that is enough to cause a problem. So that was still an issue. In the learning situation here, what we found was that the extra features, they look great, they sound wonderful, but they don't necessarily increase learning or uptake. We really had a pretty good uptake when we just had the basic video feeds. Adding more features is cool looking, but doesn't really affect learning that much. Then we diagnose what the issues and problems are. So we have a small benefit from these technical add-ons, but the big problem I think you may know is that the teacher gets swamped. Every feature you add is extra work. And the one thing that we found working with other teachers and ourselves, of course, we're a technical team, so we're very technical, but not every teacher, not every teacher is technical. And even for myself, I could be a programmer, I could know all of the system very well. Even then, problems pop up. Why is the whiteboard not working for Mary, but for Susan, it's coming through fine. Some people's video they can't see, but they can project. Some people can see the desktop we're sharing, and a couple people can't. How do these things happen? They sound like great features, but the problem is they add more work to the teacher. And that work just becomes an overload, swamping the teacher, which is already pretty difficult to start with, even with basic video. So if we look at the stages here, we went from stage one, stage two, stage three, each time adding features. Yeah, they're very cool, they're very interesting. Everybody says they want them before they get them. But once they get them, they're overwhelming and push you over the edge on workload, especially during that class time. Class needs to begin now. You know, that's the whole point of synchronous. And it's very hard to be working on something and you delay class 20, 30 minutes, an hour. You know, you can't really solve some of these problems in an hour because you get, you know, you get confused. You get, <laughs> you get all upset. So. That's the real finding. I think everyone common sense experiences this, but until you experience it, you might have a little hope that it's easier than it seems to be. So students who need help the most are also the people who are least open to help. This is a very confusing <laughs> bit here, but it makes a lot of sense. If you're in a classroom, you can very quickly kind of narrow down who needs the most help. If you're collecting assignments, you can find out who needs some more help and give them a tutorial or give them some extra help. But when you're in synchronous video meeting, the people who need the help the most are maybe their video's not working, their audio is not working, and you don't know how to solve the problem and there's really nothing you can do to solve the problem because you have no way to reach them. The worst case scenarios, they're not connecting at all. So they text, maybe you have some kind of text channel. We would use like a kind of Twitter kind of clone that we have and or they post into a posting board or they send an email or you use the phone and they say hey I can't log on uh, my bandwidth is not not enough or something's wrong with my computer and how you help those and the one thing we did see in this study was the people who had those issues were the same people who had them over and over again and that was hard to overcome so now we move into using the immersive virtual environment so this idea of having your virtual simultaneous class, not just video, but to actually have a virtual reality space where students can become avatars and the teacher can become an avatar. Now the advantage of this seems obvious in that you're not dealing with video anymore. So students would be more engaged maybe, maybe they'll be more um, interested to use this because it's like a game they've played like Minecraft. Also, they don't need to worry about their appearance, so, and they can take on any kind of avatar they want as long as it's you know allowed inside your situation. So this sounds like a very good idea, and so we go ahead and execute that through a few rounds. Let's take a look at some of those results. Here's some pictures of my class and another teacher who was involved in a project. We had a business negotiation class in this example, 
And so here we can see the very straightforward situation, for example, of giving a lecture. So that's the teacher up there flying in the air, and the students are down here listening to the teacher's lecture. And then behind the teacher is the actual course material that pages through as the teacher talks. Here's another example of that with another teacher where they use the slides from the class floating up in the air and you had this kind of virtual space here and the students are down here watching and listening to the teacher. So the audio is live, they can hear it, and the video is replaced by this virtual reality. Inside another class that a teacher had, she was using these islands to represent groups. So groups would meet on islands. And the teacher could fly around and go to any island and check up on the group's projects, for example, if they were doing a problem-based learning exercise. And the students them, themselves, they could take a boat and go from the boat uh, to the main classroom where there may be a lecture, and then they have breakout sessions that come to the island. Now, that's really no different than having breakout sessions in a video meeting space. So a virtual reality and a video conferencing is not really that different, but you can see how it might engage students more because you can be very creative about how you present it, the metaphor you use, in this case using an island metaphor. Pretty cool. All right, let's look at the results and how that works. So in the first stage, we're going to go ahead and test the basic premise of how this works. So the action plan is to design a virtual space that reinforces the teaching points that we're going to have. Then for the action, we have a business negotiation class where we implement this, as I just showed you, and we emphasize role playing. So it kind of fits well. Students are playing like business people, and so they have businesses which are small groups, and they can be on the islands. So it kind of made some sense in that way. So we evaluate this kind of class we executed for a couple years and we find out that the students are actually engaged. They like this idea of controlling more. But we also have audio issues and it's exactly the same as the audio issues that take place in the video conferencing. That is, someone does not have a headset, they have an open microphone, you get an echo, you get a feedback and it ruins it for everyone involved. It's a little bit different in virtual reality because when your avatars get far away, the volume goes down, you can't hear people. In a video meeting, you can hear everyone the same. So it's a little bit different, but the result is fundamentally the same. When they gather together or if they're in groups and they're getting that problem, you're getting feedback and echo problems. So for the learning, we, it encouraged the students to take control, to command their learning space, which is really part of the goal in this kind of um, teaching situation. But the most, problem, most problematic part is the audio. So that seems to really be a consistent part. Now we move on to cycling. And so we do this for a couple years and then we execute a bit deeper, a bit more and see how far we can go. And here's examples of taking that virtual reality and really upping the game on it, really doing more than just having those islands. Here you can see we have uh, meeting spaces in, in large, like almost hotel lobby kind of situations. We have rooms where we have book information from the book and slides from the lecture. We have places where you go downstairs and you can break out into different rooms with your groups. We have outside areas that can be explored. So all of this is pretty interesting stuff and really is uh, kind of fun for the students. So how does this end up working out in practice? So the action plan is to have multiple virtual campuses and buildings with rooms. And then we go ahead and we design that and we design the interiors. There's, these are all custom designed. It sounds like it's hard, but it's not really that hard. You can use things like open source and even Google has some tools for designing 3D uh, spaces and, and, and stuff like tables and chairs, all the things you can put into the virtual space. So yeah, it can work out pretty good. It's not that hard. The problem was when we evaluated this that the space is kind of big. It allows free moving around, but students get lost. You actually have a situation where some teachers would have class and some of their students wander off and can't figure out where they are or how to get back to where the class is. 
So you need to collect students. Now, of course, you can message them inside the system. You say, everybody come to this certain space, but then how do they know where that meeting space is? Or come into the tall building into room 104, and they get kind of diverted and uh, get lost again. So it sounds like it should work, but this was a problem. The advantage of having the open space becomes a disadvantage of students just, you know, doing their own thing, kind of. So students who needed the most help again, guess what? They are the ones that got lost the easiest. So we come back to this situation where the very students who need your help the most are the ones that are the most difficult to help in this case because, again, where are they? They're detached. Now in the virtual space, you can find them, you can track them down, but then you've got to leave the main group, you've got to go send your avatar, or you have to send an audio message or a text message, and even then it's, like I say, if they don't know where you are or how to get there, how do they do it? You need to go over there and basically take them by hand and bring them back to the space where everybody is. So, easy to say, hard to do. So in this expanded effort, what we're doing is we're looking at getting students interested and it did work. They get more interested, they love to explore, they find it very exciting and it's very interesting. It matches their experience with playing RPG games. But again, the teacher gets overwhelmed. There's just too many things to do. You have to hold the class, you have to hold the lecture, you're trying to find those who are getting lost, you're trying to herd them all together. So it does get very complicated very quickly. So when we diagnose this situation, we end up with the main problem being, again, the audio feedback. Very, very difficult to stop. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to look at the takeaway. So we have two major efforts. One is synchronous video and one is the synchronous virtual meeting space. So we have these two projects we undertook over multiple years of cycling through and adding features and finding out what the problems are. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what we think we can do to address this situation. For any kind of online teaching you're doing that's synchronous. So let's look at a make and break features for the video conferencing. You really do need to have control over the student's behavior within the space. And what this means is you need to mainly be able to control their audio. Students who are having trouble with the audio, you need to be able to shut it down, mute it, so they do not influence or disturb other students. The best situation, the best outcome is that the lectures are effective and you have some interaction. Now, of course, in the video lectures, you cannot have tons of interaction because they're all there and when they interact with you they're also interacting the audio is going over to the others unless you do breakout rooms but once you start to do breakout rooms then you're leaving the others alone so you see it gets difficult very quickly but it does have some level of interaction the worst outcome is you just have a technical breakdown especially with audio or video and it becomes very difficult to troubleshoot you would think this doesn't happen often, but it seems to happen every single class. At least one, usually more students have an issue. Then as a teacher, you're left making a decision. Am I going to be helping this student and postponing class for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or am I going to just move on? So that is always the problem with the video. Let's look at the virtual space. So the immersive virtual environment what is the main feature that you get with this? And that would be you have a virtual space that really reinforces the learning goals. So in our case, if we're doing a negotiation class, we can use buildings and offices and spaces that really make you feel like you're there. If you're doing a different kind of class, like an information hunt, you can have islands where people go out looking for things, or you can break out into different spaces if you're having group work. So that virtual reality can really reinforce your class goals, your pedagogy goals, and help students with their learning and their uptake. They do get excited about it. The best outcome is that you have self-directed learning with groups and individuals in a kind of role-playing way, and they do enjoy it, they do like it. The worst outcome is that students become distracted or lost. And of course, again, because the environment is so rich, they just go off in different directions or get distracted, and um, yeah, wow, that's not quite what you were intending. So what we end up with is a model that we're going to present, and this model has two axes, the y-axis and the x-axis. So first of all, 
this is a trade-off. This is what we've learned from this multi-year project with thousands of students that there's really no one solution that solves all problems or one best way to do these things. It's always going to be a trade-off. And the main trade-off seems to be along this idea of centralized control or distributed control. And I guess that really goes back to the classroom, doesn't it? Because in the classroom you have that centralized control with the teacher there. But when you're going online, you're automatically distributing some of that centralization right away. So that's kind of what we're talking about, but only in the online context. So when you lack a central control, it's going to be a problem. But at the same time, if, if you have too much control, you end up being overwhelmed. You have too many things for the teacher to do. So let's take a look at our four quadrants here. What we have is a distributed control. So this means that you give control over to students. They kind of do things on their own more and more. On the x-axis, we have the authority over the system, which would be the teacher can push buttons and mute people, maybe freeze people, maybe send private messages to people, control them more, manipulate the software so that the students get a message clearly. So in this quadrant down here, where we have the no-go kind of sign, of course nobody's going to be working on this, are you? Because this is going to be the teacher has very little control and the students have very little control. So I guess that's like a broken system, so it doesn't really work at all. In the opposite, you have conflict because the students, the learners, are having a lot of control, a lot of freedom, and the teacher has a lot of control. And this can cause conflict, and we did experiment with this, where you give students more space, especially in the virtual environment. They can do more, but the, what do they do? They wander off. Well, then the teacher has more control because you can find them, pull them back. You can even use such things as teleport them, for example. You can just send them back. We tried that. But then students get frustrated. Why'd you send me back here? I was over there doing something that was interesting. So this is a conflict space where students and teachers have too much control and they interfere with each other. So the two zones that we think are maximal are the distributed with student having more control and then the teacher having less control. So in a virtual space, this is a good example, you let them go out and do some maybe hunting or some group work, finding information, presenting to each other in a small group, and it's not really lecture based. So you give them a space. So the virtual reality really does serve this better than the video meeting space, although it's possible if you set it up just right where you have virtual meeting spaces with breakout rooms. That's possible. It just gets more and more complicated. So this idea of giving the students more and then the teacher is less involved and less control. On the other hand, a more teacher-focused control is leading, and that really matches the video conferencing way. But again, you need to have control over things like the audio, muting, kicking students out, or isolating them, and that's the teacher's control. So this is the nexus of control, and I think that probably if you've done some online teaching lately because of the COVID situation, you've probably run right into something like this, only we've elaborated it through multi-years of research. So good luck with your teaching and uh, yeah, let's all try our best and not to get overwhelmed. Thank you.